fire at around 11.30 local time. Uh, the details are kind of sketchy, but what I know right now, what they're telling me, like 27 deceased and over 20 or 25 injured, Mr. Gomez Jr. said. They're talking about the shooter is dead also. He said, about 50 people usually attend the service, locals said. Local media outlets reported that children wow. were among the dead. The gunman died after a brief car chase into a nearby Guadalupe County slightly to the north, a sheriff's office deputy from that county told CNN. But it is not clear if he was killed by police or himself, the spokesman said. One witness, Kari Matula, said, told NBC News, we heard semi-automatic gunfire. We are only about 50 yards away from this church. This is a very small community, so everyone was very curious as to what was going on. The pastor and his wife were out of town at the time. The pastor of the neighboring River Oak Church told KSAT 12, We were in the middle of our church service down the road when we got phone calls from our friends about this, and they said there was an active shooter at First Baptist Church. He said, we had some first responders in our church. We immediately left and went down there and then praying. We knew the best thing we could do was to stay out of the way. He said that people had been told some news which was private and personal for the families that are here. We cannot release any of that. Sutherland Springs is a small town with just a few hundred residents, which lies about 50 kilometers southeast of the city of San Antonio. The San Antonio FBI branch said its agents had been deployed and there was no indication of the gunman's motive. The FBI also said that while only one shooter was reported, it was looking into other possibilities. Photos and video from the scene showed the area taped off by local law enforcement. A number of helicopters have arrived to transport the wounded, case at 12 reporter Max Massey said. Texas Governor Greg Abbott said, Our prayers are with all who were harmed by this evil act. Our thanks are to law enforcement for their response. He said more details would be released by the Texas Department of Public Safety shortly. President Donald Trump, on a tour of Asia, tweeted, May God be with all the people of Sutherland Springs, Texas. The FBI and law enforcement are on the scene. I am monitoring the situation from Japan. Huh. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So because of the amount of injured, there's a possibility that 40 people could be tallied dead at the end of this. Yeah. I, didn't they say it was like 50 that regularly attend the church? Uh, let me, let me check think, that. I think, I think there was something so. like yeah. that at the beginning. So there's this. That is a massively high percentage. You know, and I was sort of expected, like... When I started reading that, I was sort of expecting, like, one of the people in the church to have pulled out a gun because it's fucking Texas. But I guess not. Yeah, that is that is a little surprising. There's, maybe it's a different kind of church. You know, there's, there's such a variety in Christianity. There's some that, you know, they're pretty anti-gun. Some various yeah. uh, church communities, even in Texas. And we're anti-America, like Jeremiah Wright. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th I think anti-gun might go with that. Um, um these things, <laughs> I have no idea what to say. They, they're, they suck. I really, I feel like when you, when you hear a story like that and you think about the people and you realize it's only been, yeah, an hour and a half since this occurred or whatever, I, I sympathize with the people who advocate for gun restrictions. I don't I don't agree with that as a solution and it's certainly not right to advocate for state violence to prevent other people from owning a thing. But the desire to do something, the desire to uh, flip a switch and solve the problem in some sort of magical way, which is the promise essentially that gun uh, gun control advocates offer is this promise that we don't have to deal with mass shootings anymore. We won't have to deal with anywhere near this level of randomized violence. That that promise is tempting, even though it's false. Uh, 
Yeah. When you hear this, you know, you, you think about the dead kids. Like, well, if all we have to do is prevent people, you know, get a law passed and that would solve it, then let's do it. The, the impulse. Hey, it, rational from a perspective that is not really aware of the nature of reality. Yeah, de- well, and also that is <laughs> equally naive to assume that the government won't take the place of other mass shooters and kill people anyway. I mean, cops are more dangerous to U.S. citizens than terrorists are by, yeah. like, magnitudes. And we're yeah. we're supposed to, like, entrust these people to be the ones to take the guns and then not use the only guns that are available to commit acts of murder. The left loves that for some fucking reason. Even though they'd love to say black lives matter, they're not willing to let black lives be fucking armed. Right, right. And and that's the thing. A lot of these gun control policies, the people that they hurt the most are the poor. And especially, yeah. you know, and th- there is, you know, a higher percentage of poor people with a, a certain level of melanin in their skin that the left claims to care for, like you're saying. And uh, they have a harder time acquiring uh, weapons legally. They're not; they're much less likely to do something like get the education that, that is, you know, quote unquote, necessary by the state and to pay the money to do all that and to get certified and recertify year after year in order to because th- there's a, a lot of fees associated with that. So the poor yeah. are much less likely to do that, and thus in either less likely like if they're law abiding they're not going to own a gun then and if they aren't law law abiding um then you know it's it their their guns will be illegal and a uh, black market anyway but it also puts them in a position where someone who is not looking to do harm to others just looking to protect themselves but doesn't can afford or doesn't feel like they can afford a concealed carry permit are lend themselves or put themselves in a vulnerable position to potentially being locked in a cage because they bought a weapon to protect themselves from others. Well, and yeah, it just hurts and, marginalized. And the amazing thing about that is that the fact that they could be locked in a cage for owning that weapon means that it polarizes the the the, the people who want to defend themselves and their families. Uh, it polarizes them away from, quote, law enforcement. And it does that, and then suddenly, the only people that own guns in any given area with severe gun control or severe gun regulations are guns and or gangs and cops, which yep. the anarchists like us aren't, you know, very much different from one another, but that's aside from the point. No, the, I mean, one has the, uh, different different outfits, really. Yeah, yeah, diff- different different rags, but like the the same the thing is that people are used to making exceptions for certain groups of people. That's what has to stop. Yeah, irras- irrationality. Yeah, like you're saying in terms of mass shootings, I mean the the if you know some sort of Islamic terrorist uh, wants to commit a mass shooting or whatever, I'm just making up a scenario in a particular area, they will be able to get some form of a semi-automatic rifle to do it from the FBI, who are the ones who recruited them to do the shooting in the first place. Mm-hmm. You look like It's pretty much all the terrorists stopped, quote-unquote, by the FBI have been them just trying to radicalize people in order to convince them to carry out a terrorist attack. Then they pick them up. They're like, ah, we stopped them. And the many, many uh, mass shooters in the last five years have had links to secretive government agency. Yeah. Of some form. Uh, Way more, a much, much higher percentage than the general population. I don't, know of anyone in my life that has connections to or interacted with the fbi or cia or spent some time you talking with officers in a room and were contacted by them and reached out to them i don't know anyone 
but we're talking it seems i think it's like 50 or so percent of quote unquote ma- you know like mass shooters do you have these connections it's it's a way uh um it's way disproportionate too to be, yeah to be coincidence it, there's some potentiality that they were you know to play you know devil's advocate with myself as the kind of conspiracist in this scenario there's some potential that the reason why they have these interactions is because the you know, FBI recognizes them as dangerous uh, but we do know they do recruit people and uh, give them tasks to perform in order to carry out attacks on others. That is something yeah. they do regularly. And they stop them regularly as well and then throw them in jail and then talk about how successful they are. Yeah, well, and not to mention that, but the, it's always, it's almost always um, claimed that they're just infiltrating a deeper organization. Well, okay, maybe they are, but maybe these deeper or- organizations wouldn't exist if the black markets hadn't have been so enriched by the state's bullshit legal structure. So fuck them anyway. Yeah. Yeah, um, was there anything on the motivations of this shooting? Uh, they don't know the motives yet, as far as I'm aware. Let me, let me, I'm, let I'm me kinda, check and see I'm kind of curious here. if, you know, uh, Antifa, 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 anti yeah. fascists the commies they talked on November 4th about you know doing a, a civil war and I think that was just hyped talk but they did have some demonstrations protest stuff and yeah. I really thought that there would be much more many more news stories today about how violent those got than they actually were I'm super grateful that they haven't been abnormally violent for them or engaging in some sort of uh, dumbass, ill-fated uprising that if it was ex- successful would probably put us in a worse condition than we are now. Not that it, it ever had a chance to be the minority population. I'm, I'm kind of, it wouldn't surprise me if there were some connection if if that is a potential motivating factor for yeah this shooting, I mean, I mean it's r- one remember the fifth of November. What? Yeah. Yep. Oh. I mean, just don in. your v- just don your mask and and suddenly you're you're fighting terrorism even though you're shooting up a church. It wouldn't surprise me. Of course, I'm an asshole, but yeah. It was it. Uh, do you know like the um, makeup of the church? Like, were there a bunch of pale faces in there? Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so the pastor's 14-year-old daughter and all of his family's close friends were killed in the attack. Oh. I'm look. Um. I'm, I'm just kind of okay. curious. I, I know uh, they so are I'm looking a very anti-white now. organization. I'm looking at the service now. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of white people. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily mean anything at all. Right. Yeah, but it is know, it just, is a fact associated with the case. Yeah. You just you always want to know motives because it helps things feel a little more sane. Having having reasons behind attacks that make sense or or at least make some degree of of sense you know that there was a rationale behind it makes it feel less random and the world feels like it's a little bit more organized and and in order like uh i I, it sucks and it's evil but at least i'm not uh, confused by it whereas it's really it's really interesting that we we still don't have motives for stephen paddock and yeah. the Las Vegas shooting. But he's definitely a terrorist, you know. There's def- even though we don't know the motive, even though he didn't make any demands, even though all he did was kill people, and, and you know, conspiracy theories aside, um, they're calling it terrorism when it's de- like definably not. Yeah, or it might be definably so, but there's no grounds for calling it that. 
Like you just there isn't the well, information right. available, like you're saying. But you know, I mean, if there's not the information available, then the terrorism itself failed. Because yeah. terrorism is designed to get like, oh, you know, you keep on doing this kind of thing, there'll be more of us. We'll keep on killing you. We'll keep on blowing up your public squares, your world trade centers. That's what terrorism is. It's not just so, some act of violence that happened. Yeah. Yeah, if you're not uh, communicating the message to the public in some form, then you're definitely uh, very unsuccessful in terms right. of doing something for a political reason or you don't depending on what, but, what your political reason is but what Maybe i'm seeing here is to get uh more security in vegas hotels yeah well what i'm seeing here on all these news stories appears to be the same general thing which is that they were primarily white they had no idea why this guy was coming in and shooting them um but he he did Fucking A, man. Um, Frank Pomeroy, the pastor of the First Baptist Church, tells ABC News that his daughter is among the dead. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's a shame. Hey, don't shoot people, you know? At least not random people or a bunch of people just having a church service. That's my advice to everyone out there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I man. just I can't see any motive anywhere okay. here though. Yeah, it's it's still real early. We'll see. People will uh dig shit up about this guy. We'll learn information about him. Although yeah. depending upon what his motive is. I don't know how much you never know how much you're gonna learn from uh CNN. Just depends upon what, what they happen to find about him. Well, I'll send you the article from the BBC in the uh, cha- in the Twitter chat so that you can post it for our audience. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's all. That's I a don't shame. Know. I don't know what else to say about that. Just felt like we're we're just recording and that just happened. So to at least bring it to people's attention and talk about it together. I don't, I don't know, man. Matt, like. I just think you kind of you kind of wish a few people had been in that church who spent some time training with their concealed carry weapon, you know, who had, yeah. who had an idea what they were doing, and maybe there were, and, and maybe they just got shot, you know, before they had a chance. There's a lot of chaos in there. I couldn't get couldn't get a clear shot where they went shoot someone else. I I, I don't know. Well, well, it's you know, <laughs> I don't want to make too many assumptions here, right. but. What I can say is that if they're the same 50 people who regularly attend that church, if if it's always generally the same people who attend that service, um, then the ones in that service previously just did not look like concealed carry types. They looked like, you know, soccer moms and uh, fucking dad joke dads. Yeah, yeah there is there is that... Uh bit of culture it's just there's a lot of concealed carry people that don't necessarily look like the type too um yeah uh, i hope uh hope everyone <laughs> their family's healed and the people who are hurt they uh, don't die <sighs> okay yeah. let's let's transition to something what do you want to talk about next <laughs> i have a few things uh, we got to get we got to get out of this cuz i have nothing i Apparently, I should have collected my thoughts a little bit more beforehand. <laughs> oh well, I mean, cause I, I don't think there's a real good way to collect your thoughts. I mean, you know, our thoughts go out to the to the people who who have survived, the people who lost loved ones and friends and uh, and co coworkers, colleagues, the 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 town that's got a big dent in it now that probably won't function as well. You know, they'll probably need to do something to get more people in there but you know it's it's always a tragedy when things like this happen but there's not much you can say other than try to learn some sort of manner of self defense so that you can keep this kind of thing from happening should there be another crazed maniac in the future 
Yeah, uh, I did. This just uh, this just struck me. One thing that you were going to talk about uh, that is uh, pertinent now that you talked about discussing a few a few weeks back is uh, why pacifists make you angry. <laughs> would, do you feel like this would be a suitable time for you to rant on that? Or I, I mean, I, I think I think if 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 it's not obvious that violence is acceptable in some times and that it might be necessary to preserve um, some innocent people's lives. If, if, if that's not obvious and if it's not obvious that pacifism is the wrong approach, um, then I don't know what would be. I think pacifists a lot of the time are just non-committal pussies and that they don't give a shit about the philosophy. I, I think a lot of the time it's not about, you know, turning the other cheek. It's not about spiritualism. It's not about um it, it's it's not about trying to make the world better. It's about they don't want to fight. And to me that that, you know, everything they have was garnered from somebody being violent to somebody else. Everything. And I, I to, don't think that's true. Why not? Why why not? Uh, well, you're the one making the claim. <laughs> Can you explain yourself a little more? Yeah. Why everything they have um, is garnered from somebody else? No, it garnered from somebody being violent. Somebody being violent. Yeah, I'm sorry. Somebody well, violent. I mean, this if you go to Walmart, you buy things that are generally garnered from very poorly paying labor you um where's the, the, the well the violence comes from people being forced to continue working um not even allowed to own themselves enough to take their own lives um because they have mechanisms in place to stop that sort of thing from happening I, you, um, you have not described violence yet that's just the the tip of the iceberg, though. Okay. There's all there's also the way that that stuff gets to the store, uh, which is with automobiles uh, that have gotten their oil from war torn regions of the world. Um, often, not all the time, but often and often enough that I would say that it's like most of the time. Um, that have gotten their steel mined from places, uh, similar places that have gotten their lithium ion batteries mined from similar places. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a hippie get out of their lithium ion battery powered hybrid or electric vehicle that was basically created from parts mined in Afghanistan and Libya. And, um, uh, you know, under the U.S. government's watchful authoritarian eye uh, with their creation of uh, radicals so that they can justify a military foothold in the region, uh, there, there's, there's a huge amount of violence that goes into pretty much everything. So, but it's, it sounded like you were talking about, I, I guess I misunderstood you, the um, violence as a... A good thing. Uh, no, I'm, the, I, I'm the, not right now. Not right now. I'm just saying, like earlier when you were talking about the the pacifists, everything that they have I'm, comes from people being violent to one another. But I'm the, I'm all talking the violence you described were against, right? Um, in that form, yes. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that if they want to participate in this this system at all. They're not pacifists to begin with, so it undercuts their entire philosophy. So unless they want to be a monk, unless they want to adopt a Buddhist philosophy or Hinduist philosophy or something like that, or even a, a rigid and extremist Christian philosophy where you always turn the other cheek um, and, you know, offer your cloak uh, if a man takes your jacket, I think that's the verse, um, yeah. you know, the... Unless somebody wants to do that sort of thing or find an atheist way to do so, to do something analogous to that, um, th their entire life is built on somebody else's violence. Um, so it's already undercut. But beyond that, um, there's also the idea that th they won't 
do the same violence that somebody else will to defend people because that's not pacifistic. Pacifism means that you're always finding the peaceful solution. And, you know, that's not always there. And so it's a really cowardly sort of non-committal way to live that I th think is conclusive and empirical evidence that they lack a spinal column. And I dislike them severely for that because th they're going to be one of the people one of these days who says, I don't want to be violent. And then somebody else is going to do violence on their behalf and they'll thank them. Yeah. There's no, there's, there's no way that they can live that isolated life, you know, free of action and also free of consequence. You don't get to sit on your ass while other people are being violent on your behalf and not have anything come out of that. All right. Let me, let me comment on a few things. Uh, one, I I don't think it, they're undercut by participating in this world in terms of them being pacifists because they're still, if they're not using violence and they don't support violence, even the violence that is uh, fairly universal in, in some respects when you talk about you know government and business collusion that is incredibly massive. You know, it's, it's one, of the, one of the largest uh, elements of government. One of the, uh, might be the biggest incentive for government growth is corporate collusion in, in various sorts, whether that be uh, bankers or people seeking oil or uh, rare miner minerals in these uh, other nations. So you get some regime change going on in there. So I, I'm not, because like we're still against that violence and we still participate in the system that we are in because of coercion upon us and upon others. I don't see us as, as right. being guilty on that, or is that undercutting our, but, our ideology? But I'm not a pacifist. I don't say that no violence is acceptable. So, I, you know, being part of a system where there is violence doesn't automatically undercut me. Now, no, aggression, no, but, sure. But, we're, but are, don't you participate in, in a system in which there is aggressive violence? Yes. Okay, but, but does that undercut you? Uh, marginally, yes, I think. I think that I think that it does like distance me from being a pure non-aggressionist to pay other people for their acts of aggression. Yes. Okay, I but th I think that's a fair thing to apply consistently. If you're applying it to yourself as well, I I don't see it that way. I don't see people un under the the conditions of coercion as as having some sort of uh, guilt of being involved in a system that was. Uh, imposed upon them through violence and imposed upon others through violence. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it undercuts the pacifists more than it undercuts you or I in the circumstance. L I, me, uh, I would. Okay. I, yeah, I, I don't, I, because I don't, the not first, sure why that would at all. Because the forefront of their entire philosophy is undercut by the existence of the world that they live in. Um, no, that's not, um, no, that's not true. <laughs> Because if their if their philosophy is that they will treat others peacefully and only favor the peaceful treatment of others, it's not undercut by the unless world of course because they, it's unless, a personal choice. Unless of course they pay for any act of violence ever. Um, sure, but not not a, if money is stolen from them for an act of violence. Well, right, but if I... money is stolen from you for an act of violence, that's different from you buying gasoline at the gas station, which was garnered in a violent region, which was made violent by the existence of the U.S. corporatocracy in that region. Um, yeah, it's that, different. that is so it's... indirect. I, I, don't, I don't see how anyone can be uh, morally responsible for that under this giant system. I, that, I, I do. I think we're all slightly culpable. I think that the more we r withdraw from the system, the less culpable we are up and up to and until the zero mark where like maybe you're a monk or something. You know, I've met some actual monks who who have shaved their heads, who are, you know, out l just tr trying to live on as little as possible. It, and it's all vegetables. And, you know, 
Add to that the fact that these people are constantly meditating and trying to get inner peace so that they can bring that inner peace to the outer world. Um, those people, those people are the only pacifists that I consider pacifistic. But all the other but, pa pacifists, so, yeah. I don't. If, if you're but, a so pacifist... So it's the same with the, all the non-aggressionists then, that aren't really, aren't really non-aggressionists. Like I'm, I I, I mean, on the on the idea. scale, yes. I mean, on the on the scale, yes. I I think that everything is on a continuum paradigm, and I'm not going to be like black and white about it when it's not black and white. Yeah, I, I'm going to say. I I'm just I try to avoid uh, blaming the victims. I blame the people that are the violent ones imposing the system. The ones and putting people in this scenario. The most. Yeah, I. I get it. Um, a couple other things. Uh, one, your characterization of pacifists as spineless is maybe true in some scenarios, but m many of the ones, people who, um, and there's a whole group of pacifists, people that claim to be pacifists, that really piss me off. But there are many exceptions. Uh, that is, uh, namely, pacifist anarcho-capitalist. People that, you know, I believe can be, are the only true pacifists. And a lot of those, I don't think they're spineless at all. It's actually, in some ways, somewhat rare to find a spineless hand cap. But uh, uh, passive, they are not afraid of fighting. They simply choose a, a different way of functioning in the world, and they have a different personal ideology. And while I think I, I agree with your a criticism of their unwillingness to use violence to defend people from aggression. It, well, defend know. themselves before anybody else. Well, yeah, yeah, and they're people, you know, people whether it's others or themselves. Yeah. Um, they they would at least at least uh, in in theory, and I'm sure, some of them would in practice. From what I know about them, they would actually put their own lives in danger. You try to save others. You try to protect others. They would just seek to do so in a nonviolent way. So that that to me isn't uh, it isn't mindless. It's just well, a, that a different isn't. ideology. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think uh, let me know what you think about this. But we live in a world where interpersonal violence, not including people who call themselves a government, is at a minimal throughout human history it almost never occurs in in people's everyday life or it's or it's so rare or it's something that's much more minor like like a mugging or a, a home invasion than a flat out murder not that those things that can just be a little less uh, uh frightening and because of that it's really easy for people to be ideological pacifists in in a sense because they never have had to use violence to the, defend themselves or others. They might not have ever like been close to a scenario where someone needed to use violence in self-defense. So it's, well, okay. it's a lot easier then to say I'm a pacifist because I don't I don't do violence to others. Yeah, I mean I haven't been in a situation where I would do violence to others in in ten years probably. It's been a long well, time since uh, I've even been close to that. But but here's the deal. If their philosophy cannot exist in all situations, then how is it a philosophy and not just a general modus operandi? Um, cause cause it does for them. It does exist in all situations. You know, I'm not saying uh, I, uh for everyone, but they would they would say that they would apply it personally in all situations. So, it, but that uh, that ideology is never really challenged in our modern world, thankfully, because they don't they don't uh, run into situations where they would even think, oh, maybe I should fight here. Well, like, I mean, unless avoid. they do, and they're one of the people that dies in one of these situations. Right, right. I'm saying, I'm saying it it might occur. I'm ju I'm just saying it's easier to call yourself a pacifist in 21st century America 
than at almost any other time. And, and I would location. and I would argue it's also easy to do that in this era, in this location, because it's fairly distant from the things that do operate on violence and are connected to the system. I mean, if you can say that because it's several hops away from the person that they're not a part of the violence that occurs, I, I, I disagree with that strongly. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I don't, I don't uh, blame the slaves. I, I blame the slave masters. If the slave takes part in whipping another slave, I blame the slave. Yeah, I, I don't actually. Um, not if it's not if it's under coercion. Okay. Well, I guess it's I guess it's my personal philosophy to ta- to give people personal responsibility when they're actually doing something. Like if I have a gun to the back of somebody's head and I say, "You better shoot all thirty of these children," um, and they shoot all thirty of those children, the fact that I had a gun to their head and I was going to kill them if they didn't doesn't mean that they didn't make the choice to kill those children. <laughs> yeah, I I think that really is is kind of counter to the spirit of voluntarism. That is that is making a decisions a free from coercion. Now, free from aggression. Yes, I agree that it's that it's the person who had the gun to the back of that person's head who spurred the entire thing to go on. And I'm not saying that any part of that was ethical or in line with voluntarism. But what I am saying is that it's that person's responsibility. I don't know why it wouldn't be. Because they were under coercion. Okay, so anybody under any level of duress... um, I don't know what duress... Can you define duress? Coercion. Okay. Anybody under any level of coercion is not responsible for their actions. I I don't I I cannot I'm, see that ethically. I'm not sure I would say that because that feels a lot more general than the specific situ- situations we've been talking about, so I I don't know. Well, okay, that I so what's your, with that. So what's your barrier to entry here? Cuz I don't think that having arbitrary barriers to that entry is the spirit of voluntarism. I think voluntarism simply says don't aggress. Sure, and but I, the voluntarism is also also involves uh, choice and and voluntary actions, and it if someone is threatening to kill you if you don't do A, B, or C, and you do A, B, or C, you haven't really chosen to do that in in a voluntary system. It's you've been under coercion, and the person responsible for forcing you to behave in a situ- in a particular way uh, due to their their uh, threats of violence is the one who should be held liable for that particular act that doesn't I mean was... uh, that doesn't mean i think uh, the person that kills 30 kids is a good person i think they're they're really uh, probably a bad person but in terms of them being held legally responsible in any sense or that they are responsible for those actions in in a way that um in in a way yeah in a, in a way that they could be held liable i i don't think that's the case why i mean let's look because at under uh, coercion. let's look at kent state these cops were ordered by the well these national guard people were ordered by the president to go advance on the college campus they did and a lot of people died so being ordered um means that there's a certain level of coercion there. You will lose your job or X, Y, Z. That's not coercion. If losing that your is job coercion. Is not losing... <laughs> okay. Though so maybe I should have clarified uh, the initiation of force in- instead of coercion. I thought we were on the same page there. But it, losing your job is, is not additioning force. That's simply saying... Well, it's uh, not, aggr- not, it's not aggression, anymore. but it's, it's coercion. Yeah, I apparently we were not in the same headspace when talking about coercion, but that that is not uh, not what I was uh, thinking of in terms of okay, alternate actions, um, because it's not uh, 
not any sort of uh, rights violation. Uh, okay, well, that's that's progress there, um, because because aggression and coercion are not one and the same, um, and so it's it's not the NCP, it's the NAP, um, but beyond that, I think that if you commit an act of aggression, if those f- proverbial children didn't attack you in a way that would threaten your life, uh, then attacking them is an act of aggression even if somebody else aggressed against you to give you your motive to attack them yeah the the aggressor though the initiator of force is the one responsible there well i would say that you're both initiating force he initiated force on you and you initiated force on the children but i don't think people are responsible for the choices made under such threats when being, well, I th- when being ruled, I, I, I don't think we can, we can apply that uh, consistently. You're just victim blaming that. I think I that like we're all into that mess. Well, well, here's the thing, though. I mean, the victim can also be the aggressor in a lot of cases. I mean, that's like saying that because we're victims of this system, we're not responsible for any of our actions and we're not, you know, responsible if we no. buy some. Why? You no, know, because any of our actions are, are not the same thing as actions specifically being under coercion. If the person held a gun to someone's head while there were 30 kids in the room and said, give me your wallet, and the person with the gun to his head shot the 30 kids in the room, he would be responsible for that uh, choice. It's, there's a specific uh, type of you know, co- coercion in this, in this sense initiation force that he he would be responsible for and some that he wouldn't like he wouldn't be responsible for uh, morally responsible for giving his wallet to the person who had threatened force upon him but just because he's under some sort of uh, threat of violence in a particular situation doesn't mean but, that n- he's not responsible for any of his actions but that a and b thing doesn't involve a c party at all so, I mean, if it's just A and B, A has a gun to B's head and says, give me your wallet, then if B gives the wallet to A, then there, th- then there is an element of choice in there, as there always is, but there's less responsibility. Because if B then does something to C, because A says to do something to C, um, or, you know, there will be consequences visited upon B, then it's still B's choice whether or not to accept those consequences or to do the thing to C. And if C is harmed by B, it's ethically, at least at first, until C potentially forgives B or that whoever was affected by the actions of C forgives B. Um, it's still B's choice. And B made that choice for whatever reason, and B then was responsible for the actions that that choice was. Otherwise, B could have said to A, you shoot them. You shoot the kids yeah, if it, you want if them If it's dead. not in a voluntary uh, situation, then it's not, it's not a real choice. So, so basically what you're saying is that um, if I, for instance... Um, formed an organization um, and then began to order all of those people in that organization um, under the threat of their own lives being lost to kill a ton of people that I would be the only one responsible if a ton of people died. Yes. If you were the only one uh, threatening the violence, yeah. But but I wasn't. The threat of violence was carried out by the people I ordered, not me. Right, I didn't. Right, but I you, didn't. You were you were the one that was that was threatening to kill them. I was threatening to kill them, but they were threatening to kill other people. Yeah, not only only indirectly, only because of your original threats on their own life. The the notion that people are responsible for uh, their. Choices in in a, in a legally liable sense, we'll just keep it kind of stricter uh, situation. 
for now for choices made in an obviously involuntary context i I just don't buy that's that's victim blaming well okay in a in a in a legal sense if if by legal you mean like government laws in a legal sense the the people no i mean legal like in natural law okay in terms of natural law um by that particular token um somebody who joins a hitman organization uh, and then doesn't agree to kill anybody uh is not a hitman even if he kills people for somebody else what because he didn't agree voluntarily well if he <laughs> he did agree voluntarily who says who says he didn't say no to every contract who said that they didn't force him to do it because he was in the organization already well, if they, I mean, it's one thing if they're forcing him to do it. That's, that's Why? a different thing. People are still dying Why? by his because hand. Because the initiation of force matters. Because and he's the one who initiated important. the actual force there. No. He's the it, one who killed the people. Yes, but the person who started that whole sequence of events, the real initiator of force, is the people who were going to kill him if he didn't do that. That doesn't make... Um, yeah, he... You can't you can't hold victims legally liable for their actions done under under the the initiation of force type of court. I would argue that the second that they are murdering other people, they're not a victim anymore. Yeah, they I, have I become you, part of not, the aggressor. You're, kind of, you're kind of forgetting that they have a gun to their head then because no, having I'm a gun ca- to your head does make you a victim. No, I'm taking that into account. And I'm saying that if they are taking part in the actual act of aggression, I don't know how that differentiates them from an aggressor at that point. I don't know how they aren't the ones creating victims. Well, well right, but you can extend that. If you, if you want to apply that consistently, you can extend that to, uh, I pay taxes. So I'm the aggressor. And I could understand somebody making that statement that I, I have paid taxes, so I'm an aggressor. I could understand somebody making that statement, and I've mulled this over in my head a lot. Yeah, I can understand someone making that statement. I just think it is ignoring the actual coercive uh, you know, st- state circumstance that people are living in, in this, this system formed by the initiation of force that people exist in because they sort of have to. And there's But there's most people could be a pedestrian. Most people don't need the gas in their cars, so they're participating in that gas being extracted from a region where people probably died to make that happen, you know, blood for oil. And that person is making that choice so that they can have a slightly more comfortable drive to work. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think you're not really necessarily aware of... I don't, I don't know if you're... I, I don't want to say that about you, um, but... That's not that's not really a choice for a lot of people. Like feeding yourself and your family and then being in a circumstance where you have to participate in a system in in order to do that. It, that's you don't not have to you don't I mean, have real, to have that job. The real problem is <laughs> yeah, um the real problem is is the people who are doing the actual initiation of force, not their victim. This notion that uh, having money stolen from you and that, that's for, not the point Ill I'm King. making. That's not the point I'm making. The money is stolen to basically pay back interest on the loans that create the money to begin with. That's the taxation doesn't actually pay for war, as far as I'm concerned. I've seen enough about interest payments being repaid and the boards of the stocks uh, for the for the banks being repaid and the 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 banksters at the top of the pyramid being at the top of the pyramid i've seen enough about that to know that it's that, that the taxes don't pay for war that's the reason why we're in such severe debt because taxes aren't what pays for it money printing is quantitative easing fractional reserve banking and foreign debt that's what that's what pays for wars but well it the, just depends upon where you want to say the taxation money is applied to. You know, it's kind of arbitrary to say it pays for welfare and not wars. I, I don't think it pays for welfare. 
You could tax people 100% and still not pay for all the welfare in the U.S., Welfare is paid for by debt. Yeah, yeah. You, so every every public you would pay for all the welfare in the U.S. I mean, we can we can bring up the numbers, but I actually I I gotta uh, get out of here. Um, but if you if you look up the the tax revenue and expenditures, you know some of it is there's loans every year that are quite substantial. You know, I mean, I don't know I don't know what it is this year. Probably like a trillion dollars or something. But the tax revenue is enough to pay for you know yearly fed- federal expenditures on welfare. Well, I I, I I'm gonna have to look that up Please because do. the U.S. debt clock normally has many more unfunded liabilities than domestic product, much less than taxed income. Yeah, it might not be able to pay for uh, future welfare, but it does at present, or pay for warfare at present. Well, I mean, but. But I don't think it pays for all of it, and if it did, we wouldn't be in debt. And you know, the the, the money creates at least one unit of debt with every bill that it's created. So, I mean, I don't see that as the thing. My point wasn't that taxes make you part of the process. Being stolen from doesn't make you part of the process. What does is like taking extra liberties, taking extra things like. That uh, that trip in your car that you don't ever fill all the seats of um, to go to your job um, that you could walk to or to go down the street to visit a friend or something like that. Um, You know, that sort of thing means that you're buying gas that was extracted from a foreign nation under coercion. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, again, to me that's not that sounds like blaming blaming the slaves for petrodollar is blaming under, the slaves. Yes, or oh. the situation they're at under coercion because blaming you're blaming the people who are in this system not by their choice, not by their desires, not what they support but for their maybe. actions within this system of slavery. Maybe I mean a lot and of these people will actively consent. Especially yep. Republicans and Democrats. Yep. Most not, people... Not talking about those, for sure. Okay, so what are you talking about? The people that aren't Republicans or Democrats? The people... What, anar- anarcho-capitalists specifically? Yes. Okay, well, anarcho-capitalists specifically can make better choices and involve themselves less in the state machine of corruption. That would make them much less aggressive, th- in my opinion. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that's aggression. Um, I got to get out of here. What do you want okay. to plug, man? Oh, just, you know, if people know where to find me. Insanity is free online. I'm about to start making shirts for Chain Reaction also. So if anybody wants to support the show, uh, they can uh, start to do that probably sometime before the next recording. And uh, if not, uh, or sorry, if, if, if they're not done by the next recording, they'll be done by the end of next Sunday. I've got a lot of odd jobs that have come up, uh, so if I don't get to that, then I won't, but I think I will be able to. And there will be shirts, flags, bumper stickers, uh, the works. So if you guys want to support this uh, show, you can do that shortly, and there will be links in the description when when you can. All right, sounds good, man. Uh, You want to follow me on Twitter, at JeremiahJM. Thank you for listening. Hope you have a great week. Peace.